Hey there, and welcome to Everything You Love, episode 36. It's been a while, right? Well, in this episode, I'm gonna recap the Camaro reunion shows a little bit, reflect on those, answer some questions, talk about some things that I think are really cool, and perform a couple reboxings. That's right, reboxings. Not unboxings, but reboxings. Let's go. All right, first question here from Savage Vids 149. After it's all done now, it's talking about the Camaro reunion shows, what are the biggest thoughts and feelings you are left with? What is sticking out in your mind about the entire experience? Where is Rob Arnold's mind and heart at post show? And what can we, the Camaro Legion, expect to see coming? Well, I don't know what you guys can expect to see coming. I hope it's something. We're all riding on a high right now because things went really well. And so those are my feelings right now that I'm feeling just great and motivated about the whole thing. We worked on this thing just from the initial talks for probably, I would say like a year. I heard maybe like a year and a half, I heard Mark say. So, you know, he'd probably been thinking about it that long ago. And so just putting it all together and getting everything organized, agreeing on everything, multiple Zoom meetings, just discussing things from set list to what the production was gonna be like, the crew, the venue, one night or two, merchandising, just, I mean, there's a million things that I'm not even saying right now that went into it all and just, just a tremendous effort. And honestly, building up to it, people kept, kept asking me, are you excited for the shows? And really my answer was, although it sounds negative, it wasn't negative. I would say, I can't wait for them to be over so that I can breathe, breathe a, sigh of, a sigh of relief um, and, and just hope that it went well and be like, ah, and that's exactly where I'm at right now. I'm like, ah, it went super well. There was um, something good happened right at the beginning and that's that the so shows sold out right away. And so that was one major thing to kind of like cross off the list. Are people gonna show up for this? And um, just the love and support from the, the entire Camira community and the fact that everybody scooped up the tickets real quick was just awesome. And then just one major thing that we didn't have to worry about so we could focus more on the music and the production and putting the whole thing together. So both nights went great. The, the crowd was absolutely incredible. I know you guys have been seeing pictures and video of that. Uh, we had a great time. Everybody clicked. All the rehearsals paid off. We played well, I thought. Uh, I'd give myself my, my, my performance, maybe like a, a C plus or something like that. And I say that because I want to do better. And that's what I'm left with right now is, like I said, riding that high and, and the motivation that I want to do it again. When you're on a tour, each night you get a little more better. You get a little more comfortable. Um, you know, you pick up cues from the other band members, a cool little tricks you can do on stage or make stops or transitions real tight and you build those things. And we didn't really have a chance to, to do that because it was just two shows and that's it. All that work that went into it, we built this, this show that was ready to go. And then it was just over after the weekend. And now we don't have the chance to really just keep pushing that, keep refining it and everything, which I think is kind of the feeling that we all really have. But Honestly, we haven't really been talking about it. We haven't really communicated much uh, just amongst ourselves because I think everybody's kind of just decompressing and kind of just riding that high of it. So it, is, it did go really, really well. We're super grateful um, that it went well and thankful for everybody that came out. And for everybody that didn't come out, let me show you this. This is the audio multi-track hard drive of the entire show that I'm holding here that will eventually be synced up with the video. Uh, we had it professionally filmed. I heard there were 10 cameras there. So that's totally awesome. And as far as I know, a pro shot, just sweet video is going to come out and be available to all you guys in one way or another. Details of that will follow, uh, you know, in the coming weeks or months as all that gets put together. But uh, you know, every video I release, there's a ton of questions. Was it videotaped for people that can't be there? Will it stream? All this kind of stuff. So my answer currently is yes, that's going to be hitting at some point. So just, uh, you know, stay tuned for that. And again, thanks to everybody. Yes, I had a wonderful time. Feeling blessed, thankful, and I want to do it again. One other little thing I wanted to talk about here that um, I get asked about a lot is why Kamira has our cabinets on the side pointing like inward towards the stage rather than the back like facing the crowd where you'd normally see them. Here's Matt right here. You can see his on the other side there. His cab is facing inward. And this is something we've done probably since like 2004, having our cabs on the side there. And there's a couple reasons for that. 
a big part of it is aesthetics, meaning how the stage looks, and there are also some audio reasons to it as well. First, I'd like to say that I was, I've always been one of those dudes that wanted the huge, just stacks of amps behind me, like Pantera and Slayer growing up, when I'd see those Slayer and Pantera videos and you'd see a ton of Marshalls or Randalls behind Carrie, Jeff, or Dimebag, I always thought that was amazing and I always wanted to do that. But we never got to do that in Chimera for a couple reasons. One is that you need to graduate to a certain level as a band to be able to carry that kind of production from show to show. Think about it. You, I mean, let's, let's just say, what? eight, 16 cabinets per, per guitar player, you know, like Slayer, they're probably doing, you know, 20, 24 cabinets at times. Um, so you need a semi for that. And Camira never graduated to that level where we had a semi truck with us on the road. We always had our trailer behind the bus, started with a van and trailer, then went to an RV and a trailer, then to a tour bus and a trailer. And that was as far as we made it when we were happy, happy enough for that, blessed to have been in a tour bus for so many years. But the trailer only held so much stuff. It has to hold everything from, you know, all the drums and, you know, just instruments and all the amps and riser decks and everything you can think of needs to fit in that trailer. So all of a sudden, when you add a couple dozen extra cabinets, you need to go up to the semi level. And we never did that. But the other part of it is for the aesthetics of it is that uh, Mark and Chris, especially, they always like to look from from some a lot of bigger bands like Nine Inch Nails and um, even Metallica nowadays, where you see their stage set up, there are no amps on stage. They like that clean look where there's no real equipment on stage. So that's kind of, uh, here's an overview of, of our stage. You see that, I mean, obviously there's drums and, and the keyboards, but there are no amps on stage. And that's a look they've always liked. And so coupled with the fact that we couldn't carry a ton of cabs, because if we could have carried a ton of cabs, I probably would have kicked and screamed about that a little bit more, but I never did because just logistically never would have worked out. But uh, that's, that's the stage look they liked and we've kind of gone with. So we hid the amps to the side, which our sound guy always loved because Mark's microphone, which is facing us and you know away from the crowd, it's difficult for sound engineers to deal with super loud ass amps pointing at that microphone and being able to separate the uh, vocals from those amps coming forward. It's enough to deal with the drums and the cymbals that are already coming through that mic. So it's one less headache for the sound engineer out front and he's always liked. We've had Big John, our sound guy, has been with us since probably 04 or something like that. And we've done this setup since 04, since we saw In Flames doing it, which Big John was also In Flames guy that we kind of stole from In Flames um, and, and stole their setup here and it's worked well for us ever since. Given the opportunity, I'd still love to have the wall of camps and cabs and, and would love to do that someday, you know? Maybe maybe it won't be with Camira. I have no idea, but uh, never had the chance. So yeah, just thought I'd mention that real quick for those curious about why we have our amps facing sideways there. Okay, time for some reboxings, the opposite of an unboxing. Let's check it out. All right, check, check. Welcome to this poorly lit shot where I'm going to pack up Austin's drum kit here and get it sent back to him in sunny California, a task that I have been chosen to complete, but that's okay, I'm cool with that because I kind of like this stuff. I like packing stuff up, sending it out, do it all the time. They know me well at the post office. Something I'm not proud of actually, those lines suck there as we all know. Anyways, uh, you know, whatever. Me just packing stuff up, sending it off, nothing special. But I thought I'd take a sec to just talk a little bit more about it. For those of you who are interested, just talk about the kit a tiny bit, and then we'll switch it over into a fast motion thing of me packing it up. And I'll see you back on the other side after a little walkthrough. All right, so here it is. This is, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, a six piece kit. We've got two. 20 inch kick drums. And again, this is a, a custom Yamaha stage custom, all birch made for the 20th anniversary of the impossibility of reason. Austin's Yamaha guy painted this kit himself. I noticed there's a little message in here. Can we see it says this drum kit was painted on 425 while listening to King Diamond's Abigail. And then uh, 
he signed it there. That's cool. Austin always talks a lot about how well Yamaha takes care of them. They obviously do. So we got two of these 20s. I already got this other one in the box here. Actually, they packed it up after the show. As you can see there, that's how I'm going to do the other one. And then we've got a 10, a 12, and a 16 inch tom here, which Austin said is kind of unique for you drummers out there who know, I personally don't know, but um, he's saying that it's kind of a unique setup. Like he called it like the big boy toms or something like that. I don't know, but you can see there, check that out. Nothing remains worthless. So that is Friday night, May 12th, uh, set after the Impossibility of Reasons set. And here's from Saturday, May 13th, Everything You Love, Secrets. And then we did the set with original guitarist Jason Hagar for those Present Darkness and Pass Out songs. So those are some cool heads. I'm gonna strip those off before I pack them up. Might even keep them, you know? I think Austin's planning on getting those back though. Those are certainly cool keepsake. I know I love the a lot of people would love to have, including myself, like one of these things. Maybe I stashed one away from myself. We'll see. You might see that on my wall here behind me in a future video. So then there's the impossibility set that he had on the snare drum. This is a 14, but uh, yeah, that blood splatter turned out really cool. Let's see how this sounds. Uh... Sounds pretty good, huh? So definitely sick. Like I said, I'm gonna strip those heads off. Got a ton of hardware to pack up. You'll see that shit is heavy and annoying, but we got the uh, big hardware case there. And uh, yeah, so that's it. Super cool kit. I know you guys have been seeing a lot of this lately in my videos, but it's just one of those things where I mean, we were blown away just at the, the thought of this thing coming to town and then actually laying our eyes on it and obviously hearing it, it sounded killer. Austin made this thing proud and it made us proud. So let's get it packed up and on its way to Austin. Okay, so we got it done. Eight total pieces. This hardware bag weighs a ton. Oh my gosh. Uh, I don't know what in the world I'm gonna do with that. How am I even gonna get it up the stairs? We'll figure it out though. Got it done off the sunny sea for better days. Will it be used again? Only time will tell what will become of it. Next question here from Silent Kid 3709 Hi, Rob. Are there any guitars you've owned that you wish you had never sold? Are there any guitars that you regret never buying? So, I do have one guitar that I regret selling, and that was this Ibanez S540. It was a seven string, and when Camira first went to seven strings a couple months after I joined the band. I first went out and got like an RG 470 and I had a couple of those. And then I saw this S540 hanging on the wall, which Matt DeVries always played the Ibanez S's in his band Ascension before Camira that I always thought were amazing. So when I saw this guitar here on uh, the, the, the wall at Guitar Center, I bought it immediately um, and started playing it. Here are some early shots. Look at that ceiling, that's crazy. Um, I bought it and uh, this was my main seven string here. There's Jim and I, I don't know, CBGBs or some, looks like some dump of a club. There's me, Chris, Mark, Andals, Jim. I don't know, was Hagar around with us somewhere or what? But anyways, I loved that finish on there and that Ibanez played beautifully. But when we got our ESP endorsement, I sold this guitar on eBay back like around 2001 and then on the 2003 OzFest, the dude that bought it, unbeknownst to me, 
brought it with him to one of the shows with hopes of finding me and having me sign it. He did find me after our set at like a Jägermeister signing booth or something, and I signed it up. It was nice to see it again, and that was the last time I ever saw it. I think I got like 900 bucks for it when I sold it, and it's one of those guitars I wish I had never sold and wish I still owned it. Uh, but uh, it's gone. And uh, I, th I feel like maybe the dude hit me up on YouTube a few years ago or somewhere, Facebook or something and mentioned it or whatever. It was just good to kind of hear that it was still around. But um, yeah, if I could still have that today, I would. Now, a couple guitars that uh, that I had the opportunity to buy that I wish I would have. I can't think of anything like that where I've ever missed out on an opportunity. But there's a, good a couple guitars that I've always loved that I wish I had. And that was like the uh, Countdown to Extinction era Megadeth, like Mustaine, King V's, and the same era Marty Friedman, Jackson Kelly's. I'm not a fan of like either body style, just personally playing. Like I'm not a V guy and a Kelly guy. I'm definitely not a Kelly guy. That seems totally awkward, but those guitars to me just were so cool and so cool on those guys. Uh, I thought at that time, you know, Jackson was the shit and like, you know, I just wanted those guitars. So if those two ever like fell in my lap, I'd love to have them as part of my collection. I'm not going to go out and buy them or anything. But those are two guitars kind of answering your question there that uh, I wish I had that I, I was never able to get my hands on. Another question here from Mechanization. Hey, Rob, question for an upcoming EYL. Putting money aside of all the creative and professional ventures you've explored, what do you find the most rewarding and enjoyable? Writing music, recording, playing live, running your own studio, video production, or something else. What tasks do you prefer outsource and what work do you insist to do yourself? Anyways, hope all is well, man. Can't wait for the Community Reunion show in May. So obviously, uh, these shows were before the Camera Reunion, but um, what did I like? I'm just, I guess I'll just say um, I loved the jamming and like kind of rehearsing with the guys and writing music in the jam space aspect of my career the most. Just being with those guys and coming up with those songs and I couldn't wait to get to practice the next day. Let's say, you know, we, we wrote the skeleton for Clensation or Pure Hatred or something. It's seriously all I would think about for the rest of the day after I, or night after I got home. And then I couldn't wait to get there uh, and play it again and keep working on it and stuff like that. Same way, I think I have memories of the self-titled writing where, you know, like, I don't know, we were working on a song like Comatose or something. And like, I'd be laying in bed at night before falling asleep and think, oh, I want to do do this to the transi transition. Or I gotta remember to tell Matt that I wanna pick the riff uh, this way instead of um, instead of uh, 16th notes here, we're gonna do triplets over the same drum beat. It's gonna sound so awesome and I couldn't wait to get in. Sometimes I'd, I'd text him or call him, dude, we gotta do this, I can't wait, so I don't forget, blah, blah, blah. And like, just building those songs and being with the guys, you know, just hanging out, just feeling that music and stuff was always the most rewarding for me. Then getting into the studio was, was, was always awesome too. Um, hearing those songs and those ideas come to life through the studio monitors. Uh, just hearing that stuff, yeah, come to life. Like I said, was was magical and I loved it. The touring aspect of it for me was like, it was awesome, but it, it wasn't as fun to me as those other parts. Now, like I talked about after this last Camera reunion show here, I'm geared up, I wanna go play more. So maybe my tastes are changing, although now it's kind of, out of out of reach for me where before you know you don't know what you had till it's gone right now i've got this feeling just burning inside me like i want to be playing every night and uh seeing the audience that was so awesome to, to feel that again um and to just keep improving the songs and keep getting better and stuff that that's the type of stuff i thrive on so i like the whole process and i guess my feelings of each one changes over over time here but, um, and then what tasks do you prefer to outsource and what do you insist to do yourself? So now I love making videos. I love doing this. I kind of just fell into it. In 2018, when I started the doing the YouTube thing, it was just kind of on a whim, like, hmm, should I give this thing a try? I just started making some maintenance videos because I thought, you know, I'm sitting here doing this stuff anyways. Why not film it and for to try to help guys who want to try to float a Floyd Rose or don't know how to change strings on a Floyd Rose or any of that kind of stuff. And it's just turned into what it is today. And I'm grateful for that and everybody watching here if you're not subscribed to the channel please do so because i'm just doing all sorts of stuff still doing maintenance stuff still love doing maintenance still love playthroughs and these everything you loves and guitar demos and all that kind of stuff like i said it's just really just blossomed out of nowhere um and so it's it's a fantastic thing that i love doing i look forward to this every single day my kids ask me when are you going to take a day off and stuff like that well the thing is is that my grandfather 
uh, rest in peace, always told me that if you love your job, you'll never work a day in your life. And that's really how I feel right now. I'm just doing what I love to do every single day. Yeah, it's a lot of hard work, a lot of effort, you know, a lot of stress in certain areas and stuff, but I wouldn't trade it for the world. So that's fantastic. Everything I do, I do myself. Um, and that's because I'm, I'm kind of a control freak. I like uh, just, especially with stuff like this, I like having complete control over everything I'm doing. So don't work with anybody, everything from the ideas, the inception to the filming, to the editing, to the thumbnails and everything. I, I kind of just do myself, taught myself through all this and um, had some cool guys that I could ask questions to. And of course, I just watch other YouTube videos to figure out how to do stuff when I want to. So you guys can all do the same thing if you have the aspirations to do so. So um, great question. And yep, super happy doing all this. I love every, every aspect of it. Just talking about music all day. Come on. Okay, time for another reboxing. You guys remember my Cranberry M1007B? Well, here it is. And it was a loaner from a friend and one of my Patreon community members named Sam. And he lent it to me to demo here on the channel and to play live at the Camaro reunion shows. So it's time to get it boxed up and sent back to Sam. And here's what that looks like. After a quick tune-up and polish, we're going to put the original stuff back into the case that it arrived with. Strap locks. All the tools you need for the Evertune, truss rod, stuff like that. ESP sticker, pretty cool. Keys for the case, never use those. Evertune instructions. ESP polishing cloth, love those. Don't know what that is. Evertune sticker, pretty cool. And of course, some of my reunion show picks. It's kind of a keepsake. Silicon pack, it's gotta have those, right? And that original certificate of authenticity for the M1007. And finally, the guitar itself. Figured I'd also sign up some show posters for them just to kind of commemorate the event. And then I even took it one step further and printed out an awesome picture that Mezgar took of me playing the guitar. Signed it. Thanks for the test drive, Sam. So a cool thing. Let's get it boxed up. Bada bing. Nothing too crazy here. A little tape will do ya. We're all set. All right, so something cool that I've wanted to mention uh, is this Brazilian guitarist named Gene Patton. Great player and about a year ago, he was out playing with one of my favorite bands, Sepultura, filling in for Andreas Kisser, one of my favorite guitarists. And he, Gene was playing an RA600 on a bunch of the shows and there's footage and photos of him all over the net. And so starting around last summer, just dudes started hitting me up left and right about this guy, Gene, who was playing an RA600 with Sepultura. So I started tuning in, of course, it was awesome to see that and awesome seeing him playing with Sepultura and he's a riff monster, clean, precise, like I've grown to really like his playing and, you know, we've kind of become friends now just talking uh, via Instagram and stuff like that. There's a great mutual respect there. And so I just wanted to share Gene with those who, who don't know of him out there and uh, what he's got going on. He's got a YouTube channel and an Instagram page here. Doing rad stuff. Oh. Hello. Oh, he's checking out the uh, Middleton STL pack there. Cool. There he is, Riven with Sepultura. Oh, got the Arise shirt. And ripping that RA600. Here he is. These guys, Sepultura, this. Exit 2022 Fest. There's the RA600. Yes, sir. I love it. Yes badass so yeah he's a ripper a lot of the stuff he's doing it's just incredible very cool but gene's got a great feel i can just tell and a mad riffer so make sure you check out i can't get out of this oh well here's some more
There's a 600. Listen to that playing. Badass. Um, so yeah, definitely check out Gene and his YouTube channel, Instagram, stuff like that. And uh, Gene, to you, again, I'm glad you're digging that RA600, man. He's a big ESP guy as well. I know he's got a nice collection, some rad guitars. And whew, I'm sure Andreas is glad to have, or I'm sure Sepultura is glad to have Andreas back, but I know you killed it because it sure sounds like it, man. All right, so that's going to do it. I hope you guys enjoyed a little Q&A there, some story time. Little Reebok, since he has my stuff packaged up um, that I enjoyed here at the house and on the stage and all that. So really appreciate you watching. If you made it this far, it means a lot to me. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel if you're not already. It all counts. The thumbs up, the interaction, comments, all that kind of stuff. I know you hear it all the time, so it's, it's nothing new. But uh, hey, I appreciate it. If you would, take a moment to subscribe if you're not already. I got an instructional DVD a lot of you know about, but hey, Coming up here, they're gonna be shipping with an awesome new set of picks. I just ordered a, a bunch of brand new ones. Maybe wait a couple weeks, or if you don't mind waiting for me to ship it out. There's a, always, a, there's a little box too, when you make the order, you can uh, give some special instructions. If you're ever like, hey, I would really love to get some of those reunion show picks. I got a ton more coming, cause I kinda ran out now, but uh, just made a big order. I got some new variations of some old picks coming out. Maybe a reissue of my Jump in the Fire picks. Uh, some, some Magnitude picks, my solo album. Some elite picks, all sorts of cool stuff on the way, and I'm gonna be including those with every DVD purchase, free worldwide shipping, DVD features, songwriting, riffing, soloing, arranging, all that kind of good stuff. A lot of you don't even have DVD players or don't care about a DVD, but if you're interested in getting those picks, hey, 25 bucks with free shipping, I think it's well worth it. Just a little memorabilia, autograph it, put it on your mantle or on your wall, wherever you like, and just get that package from me, robarnoldworld.com slash store. Please check out my Patreon campaign. I can use all the support that I can get. You get early looks at my videos, a community vibe, priority messaging, behind the scenes content, and so much more. Check that out at patreon.com slash robarnoldworld. I really appreciate all my members over there. Love the community interaction that we got going on. Love answering questions and just... Um, everything that I, that I can for everybody over there on Patreon because I appreciate that all that you do for me help make the world go round. All you guys that are watching, mad respect. Thanks so much. Rob Arnold here again. More videos on the way. Stay tuned and I'll see you all soon.